The Baltic Sea is sick. We have environmental challenges. The Baltic Sea unites so many countries and so many people. There are a number of reasons I have decided to participate in this festival. First of all, I'm a Baltic citizen. Growing up in Helsinki, of course, the Baltic Sea has, has been a big part of my life. We are all part of the problems with the Baltic Sea and, of course, then also part of the solutions. One thing, of course, with the Baltic Sea Festival is this, this mixture of culture, music and environmental issues. This Baltic Sea Festival will make the audience not only think, but also feel. We write books, we write articles, we present facts. This is extremely important that we create an engagement among people. Culture is very, very, a very, very powerful tool. Music carries, of course, uh, across the oceans, across borders, and connects people in a very sort of direct and, and natural way. The evident gains there are in mixing musical sensations with intellectual thoughts. So in this case, the music is what connects us with the Baltic Sea. I'm sure it, it's possible to improve the status of the Baltic Sea. The first work which comes to your mind is, of course, Debussy's La Mer, uh, which is the iconic piece. Hej allihopa och varmt välkomna till dagens seminarium. Um, I'm going to be switching to English today. Um, we have guests uh, with us from uh, Sweden and from the US. And today's seminar uh, is Culture and Democracy, Mobilizing Cultural Actors to Serve as Leaders in Sustaining Resilient Democracies. Um, we are meeting for a conversation that will uh, continue for about uh, two hours, and we hope uh, today to be inspiring and encourage cultural actors to lead or to continue to lead in this vital field. Uh, and we, the arrangers of uh, today's uh, seminar, are three organizations, uh, the Swedish Institute for International Affairs, uh, which is an independent institute, a non-profit organization and a platform for research and information on international relations on and foreign policy. Uh, and we are also working together today with the Council of the Baltic Sea States, which is an intergovernmental political forum for regional cooperation, uh, consisting of 11 member states and the European Union. It supports regional perspective on global challenges. The third collaborator in uh, today's seminar is the Swedish Institute. And the Swedish Institute is a public agency that builds interest and trust in Sweden around the world. The Swedish Institute works with Sweden Promotion, uh, global development and cooperation in the Baltic Sea region. Yes, so three speakers today. Two of them are here with us in the studio and one will join us a little bit later live on a link from New York. Um, a warm welcome to you, Stefan Ingvarsson, um, Elin Sarkazian, Åkerman and Evan Fein uh, in New York. Uh, I will introduce you a little bit more uh, later on in the program. Um, our discussion today uh, will focus on arts and culture, what we sometimes call cultural diplomacy and politics. Um, you will see that our discussions today come from uh, rather different perspectives in this uh, uh, overall theme. And we will see today how we can find common ground in the inquiries that they are uh, uh, looking at, the areas they're looking at. Um, you uh, in the audience, you are most welcome to join the discussion by sending in questions in the chat. Uh, and our 
colleagues here will uh, feel the questions into us in the studio. Towards the end of the program today, uh, we'll also be privy to a beautiful piece of music performed by the Swedish Radio Symphony Orchestra and filmed in a rather unusual way. So uh, stay tuned for that. Now, my name, uh, who will guide you through this, uh, 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 this discussion, my name is Hedda Kraus Sjögren. I was formerly the Councillor for Cultural Affairs at the Embassy of Pretoria, uh, Embassy of Sweden in Pretoria, uh, and South Africa, uh, where I was for four years, is of course a country where arts human dignity and political and societal development is intrinsically and fascinatingly linked. So with that recent experience at hand for me, I'm curious to find out more about what is happening here in the Baltic region because I've been away for some time. Now with that, I would like to turn to the first presentation uh, of the day. So we will start with uh, one of our three discussants uh, showing us a film, a pre-recorded film about his work uh, at the Juilliard School in uh, New York. And um, let me see. Uh, so we will turn to the film by uh, Dr. Evan Fain. Evan is a graduate and a current, current faculty member uh, at the Juilliard School. Uh, he's also a composer. He will talk here a bit about the transformation of young artistic talents into compassionate professionals through the school's many socially oriented uh, programs. Um, and I also happen to know that uh, Dr. Fain has a strong personal connection to our region. Uh, his grandmother uh, is from uh, Värmland in Sweden. Uh, and uh, Evan has also spent quite a lot of time in Reykjavik in Iceland. Inspired by Icelandic tales, uh, he has uh, 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 let the Icelandic tales inform uh, much of his music. So now, Please, uh, Evan, over to you and your film. Good afternoon. My name is Evan Fine, and it is an honor to be here today to share some of my thoughts and experiences with you, with my esteemed co-panelists, Ms. Ellen Ackerman and Mr. Stephen Ingvarsson and the greater community of the Council of the Baltic Sea States, the Swedish Institute of Inst International Affairs, and the Swedish Institute. Uh, these remarks are pre-recorded to hopefully sidestep any technical problems, but I'll be delighted to be joining you all at the roundtable discussion live afterward. My background is as a composer and pianist. I received a doctorate of musical arts from the Juilliard School in New York on whose faculty I currently serve. A great deal of my artistic work has centered on Nordic themes, in particular depicting the nature of the Arctic region and correlated fields of climate and sustainability. Today, however, I'd like to address you on some trends in the American conservatory systems, and especially the increasingly prevalent attitude that artistic excellence and global citizenship can and should go hand in hand. I'll describe how in our arts academies, young artists are encouraged to find meaningful roles not just as creators, but as proactive contributors to their immediate communities and to the community of our interconnected world. These range from traditional outreach activities to volunteerism projects, to positioning young teaching artists in schools serving at-risk neighborhoods. At the Juilliard School and many other institutions of higher learning, these formative experiences are carried forth by young artists, either as major facets of their future careers or perhaps more vitally, as part of their outlook on the power of the arts and whom they are meant to serve.
Well, I'll be focusing many of my remarks on my experience as a student and faculty member at Juilliard. Uh, my hope is that this talk will scan more as a case study than as an infomercial. I'm sure our many sister organizations each have approaches to service and citizenship that are both distinctive and appropriate to their constituent communities. And I hope this discussion will encourage you to research a bit further the many service opportunities available to the American Conservatory and university students. In his inaugural address, uh, commencement address in 1985, the newly appointed president of Juilliard, Joseph Polisi, remarked to the young graduates before him, as performing artists, you have a very important role to play in our society. I've come to believe more and more that it is today's artist who has the responsibility for making our world a livable place during these times of economic, political, and technological upheaval. The artist's responsibility is not to produce, but to enrich. Our services cannot be quantified, yet we know that we may deeply touch the people of the world through our performances. It was as radical a statement then as it seems commonplace today. For these young artists who were embarking on a career viewed widely as single-minded, even self-serving, in a nation that historically undervalued the intangible. Thus began Dr. Polisi's 33-year tenure at Juilliard and a gradual sea change in the way the school's graduates positioned themselves in society. Much of this is documented in Dr. Polisi's collection of essays, The Artist as Citizen, and even more is borne out by a variety of programs and initiatives invented for and by Juilliard students and alumni. In 1994, Juilliard launched its Morse Teaching Arts Fellowship. This program placed seven music students in New York City schools, providing them with classroom experience and pedagogical training. This pilot program, now well ensconced, was quite a risk at the time for its participants in some ways. It's important to remember that conservatories of the time, in general, prized producing major soloists above all else, that even an orchestral position was viewed by some as a second-rate outcome, and that teaching was, in many ways, a last resort. This in spite of the reality that the vast majority of conservatory graduates made teaching a part of their livelihoods. Following its fortunate initial success, the Morse Fellowship was expanded, creating substantially more opportunities for students of a variety of disciplines to work with young people, particularly those living in at-risk and underserved communities in the New York area, because longitudinal relationships were established between partner schools and Juilliard. The reality that individual fellows would come and go did not disrupt the potential for sustainability of those relationships. Another popular program founded thereafter and currently still in operation is the Gluck Community Service Fellowship. An attractive alternative to traditional work study options, this fellowship actually pays students to form their own ensembles and troops, often cross-disciplinary or multidisciplinary or cross-divisional, and to perform biweekly in nursing homes, healthcare facilities, and for other community organizations throughout the New York area. I myself participated for two years in this program uh, and found it to be a refreshingly low stakes, high reward counterbalance to the traditional conservatory activities. Uh, additional uh, paid fellowships for enrolled students include CLIMB, which is uh, combining literacy instruction with musical beginnings, the McCabe Guitar Fellowship, and the Musical Advancement Program. Currently, 132 students, that's roughly 15% of the student body, have been granted one or several of the above opportunities. Uh, Juilliard also has provided financial or logistical support for dozens of student-directed projects uh, in the past decades. Uh, among these have been the Arusha Arts Initiative, which from 2009 to 2012 provided workshops in dance, drama, and music to young people in Tanzania. Project Maruakula, which undertook similar work in Gaborone in Botswana. And closer to home, the New Orleans Project, which from 2006 to 2016 served as an alternative spring break project for Juilliard students of all disciplines. Originally conceived as a means of supporting communities damaged by Hurricane Katrina, uh, teams of uh, students traveled to New Orleans to provide master classes at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts, improvisation and performance exercises with local youth groups. And they additionally partnered with Habitat for Humanity to build and rebuild homes in the city's lower ninth ward. Uh, you, I, 
participated in this project in 2010 and 11. And here you can see a couple of pictures of a very much younger version of myself um, on the build site for the house that we were uh, working on the lower ninth. And um, at the end of the week of work, as you see, we actually gave a performance on the stage that we had essentially just built for the uh, future resident of the home who we met and worked alongside with and her future neighbors. And I have to say that uh, the Juilliard students with their combination of, of skills were, were actually very well suited to, to constructing homes uh, quickly and solidly. Um, well, initially these sorts of projects emerged ad hoc. Structural support now exists uh, in the form of the George J. Jacob Global Enrichment Program which in recent years has funded student initiated projects, including an Arab Jewish cultural exchange program in Israel, a violin based math and music program at a Navajo nation reservation, an album whose proceeds were donated to charities benefiting uh, displaced citizens of Beirut following last year's explosion, and several grants highlighting and recording the performance works by women and people of color. Happily, we've seen that many students continue to make advocacy and activism major parts of their identities post-graduation. A few no notable examples include ASTEP, Artists Striving to End Poverty, which according to the mission statement, connects performing and visual artists with youth from underserved communities to awaken their imaginations, foster critical thinking, and help break the cycle of poverty. Uh, cellist Claire Bryant founded Dakota, which among other projects frequently engages in performance and interactive creative activities at Lee Correctional Institution in South Carolina with an aim to decrease violence and recidivism among incarcerated and recently released prisoners. More recently, jazz bassist Ndeya Owens, a member of the house band for The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, founded Community Cookout, which serves to bring jazz back into neighborhoods where it has historic roots and to provide food for those community members thrown into severe poverty by the pandemic. It's becoming increasingly evident that there exists an organic process by which efforts to improve pedagogical training may evolve into advocacy for the arts, which in turn yields to a process by which outreach transforms into a platform for sustainable service. In some instances in which artists either pivot towards service completely or establish parallel career tracks, their projects engender a view of a society that supports fuller economic participation, creative pluralism, and social stability through the modalities of the performing arts. As Patrick Cabanda, who earned a master's degree in organ performance from Juilliard, uh, wrote in his 2018 monograph, The Creative Wealth of Nations, the arts and culture are not luxuries, but are essential to the central task of development, improving people's lives. If nations can fully engage their creative wealth, they're likely to reap major monetary and non-monetary benefits. More fundamentally, culture and the arts are part of what gives development and growth meaning. Still, we're forced to acknowledge the fragility of the process. Alumnus William Harvey founded the Afghan Youth Orchestra, which toured to Carnegie Hall in 2013. Now the future of that ensemble, as well as of its parent organization, the Afghanistan National Institute of Music, is very much in doubt. A stark demonstration that while arts initiatives may accomplish great good in welcoming or even in different contexts, they remain uniquely vulnerable targets to antithetical ideologies. As we move deeper into the 21st century, it is my hope and one I think I share with many cultural institutions and fellow artists that the arts do not merely justify their existence through the lens of local economic impact, nor that they serve as a vehicle to project a society's values through the promulgation of soft power. Rather that they foster a vision that may be shared by creators, consumers, entrepreneurs, and yes, governments, in which artists are not solely the passive conscience of their times, but engaged, empowered actors with vital roles in shaping the future they hope to live in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for that wonderful presentation uh, and insight into the work of the Juilliard School. I believe we have Evan Fine with us now uh, on a link, and uh, we can ask a couple of questions. Um, 
Hello, Evan. Hello. Hello. Uh, How are good you? Good morning. Good afternoon. I'm very well. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to be here with you all. Good to have you here with us. And thank you again for, uh, for showing us and, uh, your world um, in New York and beyond. And, and I, I have a, a couple of questions um, just off the bat. Uh, you, towards the end, you started to relate a little bit to the current situation in Afghanistan and, and uh, collaborations that you have been uh, involved with or uh, students of, uh, of yours have been involved with. So, so my question relates a little bit to how in your programs you can relate to uh, uh, current political changes. So like the one in Afghanistan, but you also have the Black Lives Matter and, and uh, more quicker societal changes. Is that part of, of of your work or uh, how the programs function. Thank you for that. Um, I would uh, I would say that in general, uh, since so many of these the, the those sort of projects that are taking part in the outside of this New York area are are no longer centralized as as Juilliard specific projects, um, but rather uh, initiatives that are taken by by graduates who follow their specific interests or the needs of their communities, that these uh, institutions like, uh, like in Afghanistan are you know, in, in a way, they're kind of um, no longer associated with us and have to go their own, their own way, if you understand. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, also we, we did witness, as you mentioned last, last summer, a quite an important social movement in this country, which I think students were quick to participate in as, as, you know, as well as artists in general in the city uh, and throughout the country. Uh, but that likewise, those were not necessarily ensconced in any specific program through the school, which um, although many of these initiatives touch on political aspects of our society, uh, I think strive to and count on to some degree being apolitical. Thank you. Um, and we will now turn to our, our ne next discussant and uh, a little bit later, uh, we'll come back in the forum, all of us together. And I also just want to encourage again, um, those uh, who are viewing us, listening to us to, um, tap in questions in the Q&A uh, that we have for the session. Uh, and we will come back to your questions uh, in the audience a little bit later. Um, and now I will turn to our uh, second presenter today, uh, Ms. Ellen Sarkisian Åkerman. Yes. Uh, yes. Very welcome to us. Thank you. Um, right now, you're an intern with the Stockholm Center for Eastern European Studies uh, at the Swedish Institute of uh, International Affairs. Um, you have a background in Russian art and feminism. And uh, I, uh, I know that you just recently finished your master thesis. And um, uh, I made a little translation into English of the, the title. Uh, it's called Art in the Ruins of Utopia. That's right. uh, and I find it a very uh, exciting topic. I haven't read the whole thing, but I've read the uh, introduction and the um, uh, abstract. Um, and also, I would like to just mention to those of you who are uh, watching that uh, Ellen's thesis is available on Diva. And Diva is uh, an open space archive for uh, university texts. So uh, I would encourage uh, people to look this text up. It's uh, very interesting. So um, now uh, I will give the mic over to you, uh, Ellen, and to your presentation. Please. Yes, thank you very much. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, like the art scene in Russia. Mm. Um, and memory politics. 
So um, today's Russia is very complicated and paradoxical, both when it comes to artistic freedom and memory politics. And as uh, Stefan has pointed out in several of his articles, uh, the Russian art scene is both very rich and dynamic, but there are also uh, threats against the artistic freedom. And uh, the problem is that it's very hard for artists to navigate uh, since there is no official censorship and the rules of what you can and cannot do are uh, purposely invisible and constantly changing. And uh, it seems like they are applied to single out certain individuals more than in a broader sense. And uh, a case that got uh, a lot of attention here in Sweden was that of uh, Julia Tsvetkova, uh, risking prison for some uh, colored drawings with uh, body positive uh, feminist and queer supportive messages. And when it comes to um, historical narratives and memory politics, another court case that got uh, some attention was that of uh, Yuri Dmitriev, and that's a historian that uh, was mapping the mass killings of the Stalin terror by unearthing mass graves in Karelia. And uh, he, was, uh, he is leading the organization Memorial uh, with the goal to establish uh, memorials for the victims at the site. And uh, after the organization uh, facing repressions by local authorities, um, Dimitri has been accused of uh, sexually offending a minor and uh, many believe that these accusations are false. And it, that it's a way to shut him and his work down. Um, at the same time, uh, we're seeing a rehabilitation of Stalin uh, with statues being uh, erected of Stalin in Russian cities and a low rate of uh, the young population, uh, a low rate of knowing of the great terror, etc. And as the Russian proverb goes, the future is uh, certain, it is the past that is unpredictable. And uh, so in the context of uh, all of this, um, it's uh, very interesting <laughs> that so many of the nominees to the um, very prestigious um, Innovatsi and Kandinsky prizes uh, were dealing with the country's past, and in particular the Soviet legacy, and uh, some of them seemingly even with the theme of oblivion. So that's what I, I wrote my master's thesis about, and I'm going to try to give some examples. Um, uh, I'm sad that I don't have a um, presentation since I'm talking about visual art, but I'm going to try it anyways. And uh, one uh, representative example of this uh, theme that I uh, found is uh, Pavel Atdelnov and his project Industrial Zone. And in it he focuses on the old industry of Derzinsk, where his family is from. And uh, the city is centered around big plants uh, where, that were making chemicals during the Soviet times. And these buildings are now huge ruins. And um, the project is represented in a website, uh, promsona.ru, and it has different parts. And uh, except from photographing and painting the abandoned buildings, it has really gone into the history of the place and uh, the history of the people, uh, the workers, and telling stories of the both individuals and the collective story of the workers there. And uh, he is also highlighting uh, dangerous working circumstances and so on. And um, based on these old photographs in the newspapers and archives that he found, he has done graphics and black and white paintings of the people working there and um, which uh, in which they have like smudged out uh, invisible faces and he writes uh, the recent past has ended up being as good as erased gigantic factories have left mere ruins almost no trace remains of the working settlement which my ancestors lived in the stories that my grandmother recalls seems like fairy tales my project is about forgetting, about how real historical events turn into myths and how nature conquers what man has created. Saplings sprout up through concrete slabs and destroy buildings. Soviet history, which arose as a myth in the first place, has now turned into ancient ruins, never having been made reality. 
And uh, this way of, of uh, focusing on uh, a place or a building is repeated by several more artists, for example, uh, Chaim Sokol, I'm not sure of the pronunciation, but he focused uh, in his project Paper Memory on uh, the paper factory Oktyabr in Moscow, that is no longer a factory. And in his project, he says that the heroes are the uh, workers, the forgotten workers and the forgotten media of paper. And this, we can see this theme again in uh, artists like Kirill Yushchenko focusing on uh, hotel vignettes and uh, Dmitry Marosov who recreates um, uh, events in scientific history in the Soviet Union. And uh, to other, like this theme is also expressed in different ways. For example, um, we have another artist, uh, uh, Dmitry Venkov, and uh, his work is a film called Hymns of Muscovy. And uh, he calls this a travel in space and time. And uh, there's an upside down version of an empty, very grandiose Moscow. and. Um, uh, it's known buildings and it's explored with a camera to the sound of a new interpretation of the national anthem. And the national anthem is interesting because its lyrics has, as Russian history, been changed several times to be more fitting. And um, another video work by the artist Kanis Polina uh, also um, very much seems like a comment on the history and memory. It reflects over collectivity and and disruption. It takes place in a fictive museum building uh, and it's in ruins after an unknown uh, catastrophe. An attempt to try to find out what has happened seems useless since all people interviewed in uh, an interrogation room answer, I saw nothing. And here the symbol of the museum and its function um, of being an institution of memory preservation is important since it's crushed and in ruins. And um, this uh, word ruins is constantly recurring. Uh, ruins and memory and uh, melancholy. And um, uh, other artists seem to try to establish a link between the past and the present uh, by doing uh, dialogues with Soviet artists that are now dead. Or uh, for example, there's an artist, uh, Ian Ginsberg, and he even took his uh, mentor, uh, the artist Joseph Ginsberg, a non-conformative Soviet artist, who took his last name to continue mm. his legacy. So um, I see uh, a theme of the artist trying to uh, save something or someone from being forgotten. And, um, and this trend uh, among the nominees could suggest um, the art community's contribution in the battle of historical narratives. Um, and it seems like sometimes more uh, subtle, more some, sometimes indirect, sometimes more direct, uh, to be a comment on the oblivion that is a threat to parts of the past in Russia. And it is interesting to ask if uh, this is a reaction to the memory politics of the regime, and uh, if this is a trend in a broader sense in the Russian art world, since this is only the nominees to these prizes that I was looking at. And um, yeah, if, if this tendency rep represents uh, that uh, <laughs> a trend in the Russian arts and in general, it clearly shows that uh, the past cannot be erased. Thank you very much. Um, Elena, I um, wanted to uh, ask you also, do you have any sense of how any of these uh, uh, nominees or prize winners, how, how their works are being received? Or, or do you have any, uh, any feeling around that? Uh, or what's written? Or um, just to, mm, mm. I couldn't guarantee it, but mm. since I was look, looking up their names when mm. I was writing this, mm. I couldn't really find 
an obvious backlash in mm-hmm. like in media and already these prizes are are prestigious mm-hmm. so already them getting nominated and in some cases winning these prizes is a good reception but mm-hmm. then again there has been cases uh, previously with very um political <laughs> art and artists and that has been pretty provocative that has been winning this prizes before so mm. it's hard for me to tell really. mm. i'm also curious curious about you and the 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 choices that you've made for for your thesis and and where is your own engagement coming from would you like to say something about that your road into this uh, uh, specific area well mm. I, i'm i just really uh, interested in art and mm. i I think it has a lot to say about the world we live in. It's very interesting to look at, look at what's going on there. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, the role of the, what, the, what was it saying? The role <clears throat> of the artist as uh, in New York. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and all that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I totally agree. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Stefan, if you may, do you have any questions? I think for, we'll, for, come, we'll I come. I do. We'll yeah, come back we'll to come that. Back. I will come back to that. Um, thank you. Then we are going to turn to Stefan Ingvarsson. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for, for being with us today. Um, and Stefan, um, you are with a I'm looking here in my papers. Mm-hmm. Of course, I, I know you were the Institute for the Foreign Affairs uh, here in Sweden right now. Um, and previously also uh, Councillor for Cultural Affairs at the Swedish Embassy in Moscow. Uh, so but I'm heard... here to speak about Poland. I know, I yes, know, yes. I was gonna come to that. <laughs> <laughs> but today you're speaking about Poland. Yes. And uh, we are curious to hear what you have to say. So the floor Thank you. is yours, I've so the been, microphone I've is been, yours. I studied literature back in Krakow in the 90s. I've been uh, dealing with Poland uh, in different capacities and different projects throughout, I think, 30 years now. Um, but I'm here maybe to challenge or, or to uh, introduce the ambiguity that I think that concepts such as art and democracy or artists as activists uh, hold today. And I would like to propose maybe a, as, as a, I don't know, maybe as a provocation, uh, I would like to introduce the idea that Poland today, under its uh, right-wing rule, is a sort of triumph of democracy over art. It's also a kind of triumph of democracy over science. It's also a kind of um, triumph of democracy over journalism and media. Uh, but since we're specifically talking about the arts, I'm going to concentrate on that. And I'm also going to concentrate on visual arts because I feel that visual arts have produced the most intense controversies. And it's also where you can see some shifting positions uh, that are very interesting, I think, for how we view art and activism and art uh, as a part of a democratic debate in the future. And I think we need to go back to the moment of the great system change and when uh, Eastern Europe first from, 18, uh, from 1989 uh, onwards started shifting towards a market economy, but also towards an open society, democracy, rule of law. Uh, and so the Soviet Union uh, and uh, subsequently Russia and Ukraine and Belarus and all the other new states followed. At this moment, we also had a big change in the understanding of visual arts. And it's linked to the fact that, I mean, of course, in the Eastern Bloc, there had been some kind of concept of contemporary art and, and, and modern art Stalin had been dead since mid 50s. There was a return to the ideas of modernism, uh, the ideas that art could 
be progressive, should explore new uh, means of expression, new themes, should comment on society. But still, it was very clear in the 90s that there were so many topics that had not been possible to explore because there was no freedom of expression and there was no artistic freedom. So, for example, when Moderna Museet here in Stockholm showed its big exhibition um, after the wall in the mid 90s, it was very evident that what the artists were doing uh, on the other side of the Baltic shore uh, were things that had been done, say, in the Nordic countries in the 70s and the 80s. It was like a lot of the provocations, a lot of the topics, they just needed to be explored because suddenly it was possible and you had to do this. You had to provoke with, and it was very feminist often, very sexual, uh, and all these provocations were necessary because once you've done them, you've kind of opened that space. Um, but the understanding of what contemporary art is was also linked to a kind of progressive project. So uh, those that saw themselves as progressive forces in society were also um, engaged in promoting the idea of contemporary art, the idea of an art that would explore contemporary issues, that would be able to provoke, uh, that would go into things like historical memory, uh, social issues, um, social conflict. So it was very focused on this, um, well, progressive side uh, that, that art in itself, when it's contemporary, is part of the whole progressive movement. And likewise, those who were against or uncomfortable with the changes of liberal democracy, those that eventually would hold power in Poland today, we usually call conservative forces or uh, uh, Catholic right or populist right. All of these terms are a bit tricky because nowadays I wouldn't really call them conservative. They're more radical. <laughs> because they are proposing the radical changes. Um, but they were part of the problem because they associated art with provocations against religion, uh, against historical truth, against nationalism and, and uh, patriarchy. Uh, they themselves were proponents of very traditional art, the traditional statue of heroes, of later Pope John Paul II, you would have a John Paul II in every village and town, uh, but also of uh, very realistic paintings. I mean, they were against contemporary art as such, as an expression, because they linked it to a kind of progressive leftist agenda. And of course, there were a lot of artworks in the 90s that came. Katarzyna Kozera was one of the first. She made a pyramid of uh, stuffed animals. And she, uh, like in this German fairy tale where the animals are standing on top of each other. Uh, but at the same time, she was showing the process of slaughter, the, the treatment of animals, and it was one of the first really controversial, this was in 93, artworks in Poland that got a lot of attention. And it was, of course, linked to the treatment of animals, the meat industry, and so on and so on. It created a huge debate, but also created this idea that, that the contemporary art is a leftist project that is attacking uh, a sort of conservative consensus in the Polish society. Um, Later in 2001 was the very, um, very interesting uh, trial of Dorota uh, Nieznalska. She made uh, an installation. I mean, my, my subjective opinion is that this installation wasn't a very, um, uh, it was a very kind of uh, straightforward artwork, including a cross. Uh, and she was sentenced uh, to community work, half a year of community work for 
uh, hurting the religious feelings, uh, which was a new law introduced in Poland. Later, she was uh, in, a, in a higher court. She was um, she was released from the sentence and she was declared innocent. But it started this whole idea, and the religious right in Poland started. Whenever someone touched upon religious topics, they would immediately prosecute them for hurting religious feelings. It's very interesting today when the conservative, conservative right is talking about cancel culture, because the original cancel culture, at least in Poland, comes from the, the, from the Catholic right. The Catholic right wants to cancel a lot of art, a lot of artistic expressions on the grounds that it's hurting Catholic belief or uh, disrespectful towards the Catholic majority. Uh, and uh, I think the, like the artwork that symbolizes everything that they uh, disliked was the, the installation, The Rainbow uh, by Julita Wojcik in 2012, which is also a very straightforward, not a very subtle or sophisticated art. It's just a rainbow made of flowers in the center of Warsaw, but it became like a symbol of Warsaw being an open and liberal city, uh, which it also is quite often. And so this rainbow was burned, it was resurrected, it was burned, and it became the symbol, really um, strong symbol for art being progressive. So fast forward until today. So I think until, uh, Two years ago, we would have said that it's still true that uh, conservatives in Poland look to cons what they see as traditional conservative uh, expressions in art and reject the whole like modernist concept, the whole idea of what contemporary art should be. But then the main center for contemporary art in Warsaw, Centrum Sztuki Współczesnej, was handed over to a young, very radical uh, art historian from Poznań, Piotr Bernatowicz, who had made himself famous for advocating uh, extreme right expressions of art in a small gallery. And suddenly he becomes the director of the main art center in Warsaw. And for a long time, he was, it was a bit unclear in which direction he will pull the center because as in any big art institution, the uh, exhibitions that opened had been prepared by the previous director. So it took until this very moment, I would say this summer, for us to understand in which direction uh, this new director would go. And a few weeks ago, he opened the exhibition Political Art. And in interviews, he's he has said that he wants to show art that is dealing with contemporary issues, issues in society and politics, deal with the freedom of expression, and especially he'd like to highlight and tackle cancel culture. And he wants to show art that is impossible to show in countries like Sweden or Denmark. And he has invited uh, artists that have been sentenced uh, in Sweden for um, um, for hate speech, like Don Parks, uh, and uh, Don Parks has done uh, is part of an extreme right movement. He's an extreme right activist. He has done uh, overtly anti-Semitic artwork, overtly anti-Islamic, and overtly homophobic uh, artwork. Los Wilks, who has been attacking um, or <laughs> caricaturing uh, central beliefs in, in Islam. And they are mixed with very brave artists like Alash Pushkin from Belarus, who is a very, I mean, a person really uh, fighting for uh, artistic freedom in Belarus today, but also with um, anti-Islamic art from the Czech Republic, from, from the Netherlands, from Denmark. The interesting thing is that there is not one artwork that is criticizing or a caricature of the current political establishment in Poland. So what he's doing is he's showing, I mean, in a, in a country, and especially in Poland, where the government, in, at least in the last elections, have been running an overtly homophobic agenda, and where uh, 
and the lack of other political, I, I would say real political issues that they'd like to uh, discuss. They've just been focusing on, on uh, a perceived threat uh, of the traditional family values in Poland coming from LGBTQ uh, activists. It's very clear that everything that he uh, wants to show and that is a provocation in Sweden and Denmark isn't at all a provocation in the political establishment in Poland. He has also avoided uh, quite carefully the most anti-Semitic expressions of these uh, artists because that would have also been a bit too obviously controversial uh, in Warsaw. So he's been focusing on things that are, I mean, the Polish government is overtly anti-immigrant and now it's showing in an exhibition uh, like really crude and harsh anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant uh, propaganda or caricature artworks. The interesting thing that has happened, and this is my point and where I will end, is that this uh, exhibition shows that, and maybe this was an inevitable development, that for a long time, the conservative opposition to contemporary art, to the progressive agenda, to the liberal state, uh, chose to focus on what they perceived as traditional art expressions of art, usually before the, let's say, the modernist explosion after World War I. Uh, but now it seems to embrace uh, expressions that would be modern or that they would have called vulgar and is this really art this whole debate is this really art that was coming from the conservative um, part of the society it seems to have evaporated both sides believe that they can um, propose their ideas through similar artistic expressions mm -hmm. And I think that we need to see each other in this mirror when we start discussing what is artistic freedom, what is activism, and what activism should we allow? Because the, uh, the other side, the, the side that isn't uh, agreeing with the, with the progressive liberal agenda, is using the same arguments and the same expressions and the same tools. So am I hearing also a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit of a, a critique also of, uh, uh, of the artistic expressions? Uh, are you? I mean, do, yeah. yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah. some of the artistic expressions that mm -hmm. were used, say, by feminist artists mm -hmm. or, or L artists that wanted to be queer, um, if they were themselves, I mean, we have to look at them now and see did the other side perceive them as com complex art pieces or was this simply a provocation? Because right now we're seeing this kind of the same thing, this kind of provocation coming from the other side, but then just being anti-Semitic or homophobic. Mm -hmm. And uh, is this yeah, and what provocation happened, yeah. also, I mean, are we mirroring the same mm -hmm. tendencies here? And I saw, I just uh, as a comment on the exhibition with Dan Park and, um, uh, and the other uh, artists, uh, I also saw that there was a critique from uh, the Jewish community, which is then interesting because is the critique uh, being taken over in, in a sense uh, uh, by civil society and by uh, bodies that represent different uh, different identities or different views rather than the artistic community criticizing so i'm wondering if 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 you uh, if the artistic it, the it, artistic it, yeah. community has been extremely engaged yeah. in poland so extremely please, engaged please, please, uh, no no there there's been a lot that. of and but I, what I notice is that the artistic community has been very clear that they don't want to close this exhibition. They just want to discuss mm -hmm. the way it's curated, mm -hmm. what it really perceives as art, why it's uh, inviting a convicted hate speech extremist like Dan Parks as an artist. And of course, the Jewish community in Poland is reacting kind of on behalf of the Jewish communities in Malmö, because there are, as I understand, I haven't seen the exhibition, but I've 
really tried to through uh, transmissions and recordings and other to look at the exhibition. So there are, uh, as I understand, no anti-Semitic artworks in this exhibition. But Dan Parks has done a lot of anti-Semitic art or art. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's done a lot of works that are uh, overtly anti-Semitic. So they kind of protest against his presence as an extreme right uh, activist in this mm -hmm. in this exhibition. Mm -hmm. Um, I, one more question, and then we're going to open up uh, uh, the discussion, but do you want to say something more, Stefan, about what you think um, this, uh, these, this exhibition and this kind of trend in Poland might mean, for instance, in neighboring countries and, and so on? Can you, I mean, you... a lot of, I mean, uh, I'm always reacting a little bit to because we have a tendency we, we have an east-west divide we talk a lot about post-colonialism and so on but we do also have in europe a kind of east-west divide and we're kind of always looking for ways to show how eastern europe is in many ways backwards and or uh, and sometimes i feel like france that has a very strong anti-semitic tendency likes to portray Poland as the main anti-Semitic country. Uh, and it's easy to grab this notion because the French are more you know, developed. Uh, and Eastern Europe is always uh, something more uh, dark and sinister. And I'm not saying this to excuse anything in Eastern Europe, because the tendencies that we see in Central and Eastern Europe are severe and they're very uh, and, uh, brutal. Um, but I, I, I would like us to see Poland and Hungary as um, countries with rather weak institutions where global tendencies, international tendencies, European tendencies are more visible than perhaps in countries like Sweden or Germany or France with, more, with stronger, older institutions that preserve a certain consensus. Mm -hmm. But not seeing these countries as kind of backwards or just as young democracies, but as, as places where the institutions were weaker, the support for certain uh, democratic principles were weaker, and where we see that the forces that are uh, uh, I mean, let's let's say the conflicts and the issues that are um, present all over Europe today have become more visible. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important for us because I'm for sure the the conservative right or populist right or Catholic in, uh, uh, right in Europe is looking at Poland because it seems it to them as a very interesting trial ground for certain tendencies. Of course, mm -hmm. the whole anti-abortion movement in the whole world mm -hmm. is looking at Poland because it's the country that was almost the first European country in, in modern times that was almost close to a total prohibition of abortion. Mm -hmm. So we have to see this as a testing ground for a lot of tendencies that exist on our continent. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll move on to uh, the second part of our conversation and uh, open it up for um, all of the three panelists. Um, and if you have just logged in and, and starting to watch this seminar, uh, we're talking about culture and democracy in the Baltic region um, with uh, Stefan Ingvarsson, Ellen Sarkazian Åkerman, and Dr. Evan Fine, who is with us on a link from New York. And um, now with these three presentations, we already hopped into the conversation. Uh, we shall see if we can also find some, some common ground. You come from very different perspectives uh, uh, and um, entry points. Uh, and yet I'm thinking about what you were saying just now, uh, Stefan, about the testing ground uh for uh new what i interpret as new mm. conservative uh perspectives uh of the the uh initiatives at uh, universities like juilliard where students are 
if you will, uh, encouraged to work outside of their community. And you being a student yourself, actually working with very pertinent questions. Um, so um, uh, that's, that's, I mean, that's our starting point. Uh, but I, and, I, have a, yeah. I have a question yes, to you, please. <laughs> Ivan, if, if I may, yes, because you, may. You, you started with Mr. Polisi's idea formulated in the 80s yes. as the artist as citizen and artist as an activist. How would you see that this notion has changed through the decades uh, in your school? And has there been, I mean, divisive uh, projects or initiatives in the student body that has showed, I mean, other divisions and controversies that exist in the American society? Or is your student body uh, fairly, um, coherent in its... Uh... Interesting, yeah. I would say uh, what's changed in the student body is the gradual adoption of the premise of artists taking a more globally minded role, um, as opposed to simply focusing on a craft. Um, and I would say that among the projects that have been taken on by, by students, none of them to my memory have been particularly divisive within the school, but have sometimes created a backlash with older alumni. Okay. All right. And I, you know, I, I also, I think you make such an interesting, an interesting point that, um, uh, and it's something that we've experienced all, all too recently here in this country that successful democratic initiatives and, and fuller engagement in institutions doesn't necessarily yield progressive outcomes. No, no. And that's, you know, as you mentioned in, in Poland, we have the same situation going on in our state of Texas right now, where everybody's, everybody's watching and kind of holding their breath to see what happens next. And, but do you, do you have an internal discussion on what the, the concept of citizenship I mean, artists as citizen and artists as activist is today, or uh, are you also, I mean, I mean, this is not criticism from my side, but are you also kind of holding your breath because the, the, these questions have not really, uh, you know, arise yet? Well, I mean, I, I think this, this concept of, of citizenship began as a sort of, maybe even a little bit of a self-serving way, it was trying to sell the idea of what art, the arts and artists could do for you, you know, for the larger sort of community. And, and that gradually became uh, a process by which people realized that it was actually not just about what, <laughs> uh, about selling the idea of the arts to people, but that they could actually accomplish sort of ancillary social goals through their individual disciplines. So I think that's sort of the, the process of, uh, of the evolution of thinking about what it means to be a citizen, um, to be engaged in processes, to be engaged in your local politics as an individual, and, uh, and a realization that you can advance sort of personal projects or goals through your craft um, you know those sorts of things are the, I would say those sorts of things fall more into the projects that our alumni are carrying forward so as I mentioned I think it's sort of uh, at the institution itself uh, a desire to remain fairly apolitical and to just give give students the tools that they need to execute projects and um in the work with the students and the the community community oriented work Mm -hmm. Do you also bring in a, a perspective of, of how it affects their, their artistry, their, their creativity? Uh, is that a part of, of, of how you're working? And, and if so, uh, mm -hmm. or can you see it in your students maybe that it's affecting them in some, some way? Uh, I think it depends a lot on the student and, and the project, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I think that's, that's one of the Maybe, maybe one of the more overarching goals is you take um, 
the people who have who have never been to a very uh, poor part of the country are maybe very surprised that it exists. You know that five miles from Lincoln Center is a are communities of the most sort of abject child poverty that you could imagine, and 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 then having them engaged with these with students there with the communities, uh, I think it is personally transformative. Um, and, you know, ideally will be for, for everyone who participates in one of those sorts of projects, a little voice in the back of their minds, uh, reminding them to think about what their programming choices mean, think about access to what they're trying to do. You know, does art always have to happen on, a, on the stage of Lincoln Center or can it happen in any kind of venue, things like that. Um, so more altering the attitudes towards towards venue, toward service, toward just I, just you, you know kind of what I'm getting at here is realizing that there's a world outside of the the narrow conservative lifestyle which demands incredible dedication and focus, mm -hmm. and for which they've been training in that way for their entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. Um, we are also getting questions uh, in the Q&A here, uh, and I'm going to lean forward and look a little bit closer. Um, um, let's see. Um, we have a question to, to Evan here, uh, so I'll continue on that thread. Um, Juilliard seems to prepare its students to engage in social work and active citizenship. Uh, how successful would you say that they are in their advocacy work later on in their careers? And I, I think you touched on it a little bit. So maybe you can talk just a little bit more about. Uh, sure, I, I, I don't have any um, like metrics or statistics. Mm -hmm. I, I would say it's, you know, uh, probably the majority of our students that that stay in the arts stay active as performers and teachers and leaders in their specific fields first and foremost. But yes, as I mentioned, there are, uh, there's always that portion of the uh, students that go off and make advocacy or activism uh, a major part of their career afterwards. Uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't put a number on it. I, I would say though that um, in terms of the ones that do go on, because these uh, they're they're kind of taught project management, they're taught, uh, you know, uh, given a variety of tools to, like I say, execute these projects as students when they want to scale that up if they choose to afterwards, um, they're well prepared for that. Uh, and turning to you, um, with a program like the one at Juilliard and uh, other universities, do you? recognize uh, in uh, the places in the Baltic states where you have been active similar initiatives? And if so, is this, is this something that can be developed more or, or uh, in uh, conservatories or uh, uh, training for younger creatives and so on? Yeah, I, I was, um, when I was living in Gothenburg, I was studying at a school uh, called Göteborgs Kvinnofaghögskola that is very political because it. I was studying um, um, film, how make vi like making video art, but um, the whole initiative for that, uh, that course that I was uh, attending was um, and uh, making it available, available for people to uh, um, be activists through their art. Mm -hmm. So some people were studying there because they wanted to be activists, more political, and uh, some like me were studying because I wanted to, to do art and maybe both. But mm -hmm. uh, with that said, like, I don't think that uh, art always, like the artists always have to have the task to um, be political and I think art should make life beautiful and that um, how it makes people meet can become political too. Mm -hmm. so. 
Yeah. Yeah. And Stefan, uh, I'm just thinking that perhaps my, my question feels right into what you were talking about before. Uh, how do we navigate around this polarization? So uh, have you... It, I mean, it's extremely you, difficult. I, yeah. I mean, I, I agree that uh, I think it's very important to to maintain the idea that art shouldn't always be instrumentalized. And it can also be within a liberal discourse, like uh, here in Sweden, that art isn't supposed to promote tolerance or democracy, or art uh, doesn't have to have these goals. Because the moment we, we, uh, we start assigning these goals, this is where my maybe my provocation saying that democracy has kind of triumphed over art. Uh, it were, the, the provocation was leading to this, that if we set up kind of instrumental goals for art, we'll have a change of government and we'll have a new set of goals for art. Uh, so I think it's very important not to set goals for art. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very important to engage uh, young artists and uh, students in social issues. But I can imagine the art school in Warsaw right now, which is under the Ministry of Culture, which has a very conservative minister right now at the moment. It would be very difficult for this school, if they had a similar program to the one at Juilliard's, to discourage from, say, a group of students doing a pro-life project or a uh, supporting family values project, mm -hmm. or a uh, supporting national identity and national pride project, uh, because it would be in line with mm -hmm. what's coming from the Ministry of Culture. And it would be seen as, you know, it's activism too. It's also engaging in social issues. Uh, so, I mean, um, mm -hmm. A pro-life project could be seen as engaging in your community and in a vital <laughs> issue that you're very, uh, I mean, engaged in. And, and and that's why I'm saying that, I, I mean, these we need to talk about democracy and activism and all these words that are very, like, mm -hmm. self-evident to many of us because they haven't been put on trial, really, um, until they are. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, we have a question here from the Q&A uh, that goes straight into that. D do artists uh, have an obligation to respond to political and societal issues and ev events? Uh, it's a yes or no question. No. Yeah. No. No. Mm. Yeah. Artists have a responsibility to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, maybe a follow-up question on that then is in uh, the situation where we are right now in the Baltic region, what kind of what kind of collaborations between young artists uh, might be extra interesting or do you have an idea of what kind of collaborations uh, you would like to see uh, that in one way or another, uh, how can I say, it refers to the discussion that we, we we're having right now. Is that question uh, answerable? No, I mean, collaborations are on, it depends on wh where we're talking. I think mm -hmm. a, a collaboration has to be uh, defined in its setting. I mean, mm -hmm. a collaboration could be a conference, a mm -hmm. collaboration could be uh, some kind of joint uh, artistic project. Uh, and I think, the circumstances for all of them are a bit different. But I, I think it's very important that we have a general discussion about, I mean, this is, these, the questions we come back to are so basic. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the freedom of expression, we all know, we all know that the freedom of expression is allowing other opinions than the ones you're holding yourself. I mean, that is crucial, it's elementary. We have to allow other opinions. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be, uh, a lower and lower willingness to allow contradicting opinions in different parts of our societies. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it's it's. I mean, we're we're really heading towards some kind of real uh, confrontation about the principle of freedom of expression and artistic freedom 
in itself. Mm -hmm. Because the controversies, I mean, we, uh, cancel cult, those that are oppo opp opponing, say, leftist, progressive, liberal views say that they are obsessed with cancel culture today. But looking at the other part of the, the other side of the political spectrum, they're as obsessed with canceling, you know, closing, uh, withdrawing funding to things that they don't like. Mm. So that's where we are. Mm. And uh, here's a question for uh, Ellen. Um, how uh, would you describe the situation regarding artistic freedom in Russia today? Do artists have a larger degree of freedom than political activists at large? Hard question, mm -hmm. but uh, um, that depends on what kind of art you do, mm -hmm. I think, very much, because some, uh, some like um, media of art that has been associated with uh, protests and art and activists are more, I think, more uh, targeted, for example, performance mm -hmm. art, public performance art. Uh, especially since Russia. yeah yeah so it entirely depends on what kind of art you do i think we have a, a sound in the microphone so let's see if we can Interesting. Yes. Those are the autumn <laughs> autumn winds coming to Sweden. Yes, yes blowing from the <laughs> east or from the west. So, yeah. um, oh, yes. yes. Sorry. Um, did that answer the question? It depends on what uh, what um, kind of art you're doing entirely. Mm -hmm. I, I would say. Ask... Oh, sorry. Um, no, Alan, go I would, ahead. I'm, I'm basically reminded. You know, when it comes to to concert music, which is so often. Uh, ignored right up until the moment it's being weaponized um, because the very nature of, of concert music is so abstract that um, in instances historically that I can think of uh, where it, an artist's work has come to mean something political, it comes down to, to freedom of style rather than freedom of expression. And the, the, the sort of the, the case that we are often taught in school <laughs> Uh, here is uh, it has to do with the composer Shostakovich, whose uh, fourth symphony was sort of like a uh, like the the pinnacle of his of his uh, modern gestural post expressionist style. Um, had nothing. There was nothing really political, except the very use of that kind of musical language. And when he pivots after that. The musical language becomes much more traditional, much more conservative, but the content, the subtext is much more critical and much more sarcastic than what had come before. So I think it also depends on uh, sort of genre and, and language, whether that's in, in the musical arts, or I think there are easy analogies in the visual ones, how confrontational is the, uh, is the language of presentation itself. Hmm. And sorry, I have yeah, one more thought, and I, I think it also depends in Russia at least uh, totally on who you are, and if you are an, an activist, and that is known often, if you are, for example, activist in those fields that are sensitive, like uh, if you're queer, then everything, uh, all art you do will probably get targeted, for example, with the case of Julia Tsutkova, like mm -hmm. if someone else were doing those drawings, maybe it would have gone unnoticed, she had like a activist profile so on mm. that too i don't know if you agree i i agree but i i, I would also stress that uh, uh in, in russia uh the ambiguity that you said the kind of uh, intentional unclarity on mm. the, the 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 borders that exist is is crucial to un i mean uh, everything is unclear so everyone can be framed for something financial, technical, 
because it's very difficult as a theater, as an orchestra, as, as, as anyone, publishing house, to do everything by the books because the rules are contradictory. <laughs> and they're contradictory on purpose because if you're not scrutinized, everything will be all right. But if they look into your books, they'll find something which is wrong. And it's very important to, to uh, stress this point that Russia has no uh, artistic, official artistic censorship. We don't have many cases of any artworks being censored. Uh, a theater that produces something that is uncomfortable will eventually be closed or will experience a lot of trouble but th this trouble will come from the tax authorities, from the landlord, from a lot of other um, surrounding circumstances that will be a clear sign that someone is uh, disapproving of what you're doing. But it will not be overt. We're closing this, this uh, performance because we want to censor you know, the play. That's not happening very often. So to your view, they've sort of cultivated this ecosystem that is is self-policing yes and and this whole system produces a self-policing uh, and and one of the other things I, I mean since i've been a practitioner i mean since i've worked in russia and, and and talked a lot to people who are practitioners i can also say that there is a usual misunderstanding that moscow would be more open to progressive uh, expressions than, say, other one million inhabitant cities around Russia. I would say that it's sometimes, yes, Moscow has, uh, in this old Soviet tradition, uh, outlets where the, the liberal intelligentsia of uh, the capital can see things that are a bit more progressive. Um, but also in, in the provincial capitals, you would have a closer relationship with the governor. And you also want to have a good theater. You want to have a good concert hall. So if the conductor or an, an, an opera uh, director does something controversial, more often the local authorities will call this person and say, you know, uh, look, Nikita, uh, you're overstepping a mark here. We want to keep you because you're good and you're important for the cultural life here, but just, you know, shape up. And this will not happen in Moscow because in Moscow, there are so many talents. So if you're just, if you're unreliable, someone will be standing waiting for your place and they could even collaborate. They could even kind of um, point at you and say, look, he's doing something very loyal or dangerous or controversial here uh, to get rid of you. So, so I'm, I'm just trying to complicate the map yeah. a little bit because Russia is a very complicated place where uh, a lot of, I mean, it's, it's a thriving cultural landscape in many fields. And yet there are all these unwritten rules that you cannot overstep. And queerness is what we all think is most controversial. But of course, the most controversial thing is First Nation rights, uh, you know, regional independence, uh, all these things that, that challenge the unity uh, of the central uh, Russian state. But can I ask a question? Absolutely. Because I was, uh, I was wondering, since it, is that the same way that it works in Poland with the castle culture, or, or is there an actual um, no, censorship? No, yeah. I would say that it, it's, it's very different. Uh, uh, and that's why Poland and Hungary are much closer to the developments we can see in France or in Sweden uh, and other European countries than Russia, because Russia not being a democracy, not being a rule of law, has a kind of completely different uh, set of rules. Whereas in Poland, what you can do is you introduce laws like the law uh, prohibit. I mean, in Spain, I had a very interesting discussion yesterday about Spain. Spain has one of the largest, highest percentage of uh, convicted artists in Europe. Uh, and most of them have done something um, that has been considered libel against religious feelings or the head of state, the king of Spain. I mean, you have a lot of artists who have been prosecuted for insulting the king of Spain. And this is happening in a country that we think post-Franco is a very liberal, 
very kind of, uh, you know, um, <laughs> tolerant uh, artistic environment. So I'm saying, no, Poland and Hungary have much more. To, I mean, in France, as soon as Front National uh, got control of some regions in the south of France 20, 25 years ago, they started uh, banning books. They started taking out books of the, from the local library. I mean, talk about cancel culture. That's where cancel culture starts. When you, when you decide that these books are not allowed, these books are not allowed. Um, and it starts... I think with the populist right. Then, of course, they talk about when when the liberal left is is taking up books that they perceive as racist. They point at, I mean, and everyone is pointing at each other, but but everyone is willing to uh, ban certain books. And this comes back also to something you mentioned uh, in the beginning of your presentation. Uh, I think, uh, Stefan, with a, a little bit, what, where is our perspective, uh, and the, what I would call perhaps a Eurocentric perspective, coming from South Africa and four years in South Africa, which is perhaps one of the now most harnessed democracies globally. Mm -hmm. uh, so these kinds of, of things are also, I think, very interesting when you bring up the, the example of Spain, uh, which yeah, is, yeah, uh, has so many imprisoned uh, artists. So uh, a question to, to follow on this is what, um, what does artists like the ones you, you're mentioning in Moscow or in other places, what, what kind of structures or initiatives do they, would they need to uh, be able to perhaps exercise a little bit more their artistry? Um, I think uh, you've been looking at the, the prices, for instance, that put into focus young artists, but one is a state price, so I don't know how much the state sort of influences the choices of artists there. Stefan, I know you've been, I mean, working on, on uh, developing different kinds of collaborations. So I'm sort of throwing this out there and also uh, to you, Evan, with the, the collaborations and, and programs that you do. I don't know how over, for instance, how long of a time they're running or if it's short projects. So uh, is this, sparking any any thoughts or uh, about the prices for instance um, is there uh, do they um, encourage would you say uh, sort of free uh, free expression uh, how, how have you been been looking at that at all I know the there is no <laughs> You would have schools in Moscow mm -hmm. that encourage, I mean, art, I mean, art schools that encourage their students to be engaged. And you can be engaged. And many of the projects that you mentioned, they are very interesting and they are social and they are important. But uh, dealing with the social past of a city isn't really controversial in, I mean, it can be. Memory is always controversial, but a lot of, let's say, progressive expression of uh, wanting uh, to bring back something into the collective memory is very much allowed in Russia. Uh, and also dealing with the Soviet past is very much allowed. Uh, it's, it's when you touch upon those unexpected taboos. And of course, as an art, young artist, you're... Um, you're allowed to do to be engaged, but then you'll meet a certain. Uh, well, you, know, you will understand when something is controversial. And what I'm saying is that maybe in Poland we uh, there is no unofficial uh, censorship yet, but we we are feeling that the 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 government that the the, the um, conservative establishment in Poland. They hope to have new conservative artists. So of course they will try to influence the art schools in producing, because right now, I mean, why do they show Danish and Swedish uh, 
extreme right artists in this exhibition because there is no such a figure in Poland that could express the current establishment's feelings in what you could in any way call um, contemporary art. Mm. So of course they want to produce this. So of course they will try to influence the schools. Mm. Uh, but I don't know if they're going as far as banning artists who want to explore other things. Mm. We'll see. And yeah. then, I, I mean, this is why I say it's a it's a battleground mm. or trial uh, arena for these tendencies because we will see. Yeah in the coming years. I would say in the in the United States, of course, we don't have um, we don't really have a central governing body for for the arts, per se, like they have in, in so many other um, Western countries. So rather institutions are um, reliant upon private philanthropists and um, and the makeup of any individual institutions board more than anything would uh, determine the character of the institution, mm. and and with respect to the sustainability of of, um, of projects, it's it's much the same. Where uh, many things that the that the school will support initially is is sort of a, a one off, then it's up to uh, the project directors to decide if they want to a continue it and b then find private means of, of funding the initiative or making it somehow sustainable. So certain of our projects at the school historically have been have been one off projects. Some uh, like the one I mentioned in Tanzania had gone on for three years. New Orleans was over a decade. It, it depends on the interest and the sort of um, engagement of, of individual actors and, and leaders within those projects, as well as the their ability to prove to a larger philanthropic community the value of the project. Here's a question uh, coming in from the audience. Um, coming back to Shostakovich, uh, who was using irony and citations to send hidden messages in a very repressive political context. Um, what would you, the panelists, say are effective methods for artists uh, to influence debate in authoritarian societies today? Hmm. I, I think the the subtlety, um, or I mean, Shostakovich, the, the 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 work of Shostakovich that we're discussing is not subtle in its expression; it's it's very overt. But the kind of subtlety in terms of a, a, a work without words uh, is only possible when you're speaking of a totalitarian society where everything is forbidden and suddenly a change of expression becomes a very loud thing, a very loud um, <laughs> you know, expression of your own will and freedom. Uh, in a contemporary society with the noise we're having, uh, it's very difficult to make kind of formal mm. protest in your, in the way you're expressing yourself because <laughs> it's there are funny. so many expressions. In, in uh, a way, it's yeah, just the, there's a, the the ability of the artist to create a, a protest is <laughs> isn't so great, be by virtue of the very fact that it's so easy to express oneself. Yeah, and Another, I think yeah, yeah. yeah, and I think then the pro that's why the provocations from every political angle become louder and cruder because it's one of the way for an artist to kind of make himself or herself seen. I, I think it also depends on the sort of general cultural literacy of the audience that's, uh, that's intended. And another Shostakovich story that comes to mind was, um, uh, was the, the sort of infamous premiere of his, his Ninth Symphony. And uh, the Soviet authorities had this idea that their greatest composer Shostakovich was going to create a magnum opus in his Ninth Symphony as Beethoven and Bruckner and Mahler had done before him and that this was going to be a significant page in the Soviet musical literature and um, Shostakovich delivered a Ninth Symphony that was a very light classically proportioned piece with kind of a lot of just sarcastic humorous little elements uh, and it was just a souffle and every you know everyone was furious at him 
but, but you know, there, there had been no specific uh, interdiction against writing that kind of a piece. There's nothing specifically anti-Soviet about it, except it's actual numbering. But it was a very, blushing very, now because but I, it was a I, very I, effective protest. I'm blushing now because I like his ninth nice symphony. I often Everyone likes his ninth symphony. It's a good time. <laughs> Uh, so, changing a little bit focus uh, uh, with also a question that came in uh, from the listeners. Uh, sustainability and climate change are important questions for the Baltic Sea Festival. Do the panelists see avenues for artists and creators to influence social change towards more sustainable societies? Uh, I, I mean, if we speak about visual arts, I mean, climate change and the, the climate uh, effects of visual arts have been, uh, I mean, th that's what's interesting with, with visual arts in, in contemporary societies is that they've, they're very quick when it comes to picking up uh, tendencies, uh, viewpoints. So the whole idea of making conferences and flying long distance <laughs> and I mean has been uh, very quickly challenged by the artists themselves because they've seen their own uh, sort of imprint on the climate uh, and this turn towards longer residencies longer projects and not these quick uh, kind of uh, trips to biannuals all, all, all over the world and so on. This has been very strongly embraced, I would say, by, by visual arts. And the same thing in Poland and the same thing in Russia. I would say that is, if there's any community in Russia that is uh, where the environmental questions and climate questions are very present, it's within the kind of uh, artist community in the larger cities in Russia. And the follow-up question there, you, uh, you mentioned that uh, First Nation questions is, is complicated in, in uh, several contexts, and often First Nations are leaders when it comes to questions of climate change. Is there something there to be addressed? Uh, I mean, uh, the, the First Nations of, of Russia were witnessing the, the enormous environmental catastrophe that was the Soviet Union and that is the Russian Federation today. I mean, the, 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 the harsh and uh, uh, very brutal uh, exploration of natural resources in, in, in Russia have very few witnesses. It's the First Nations usually and the, the workers who are in these very remote places that actually see the consequences. So they're intertwined. Mm. I, yes, yeah, you, there's actually mm. a, like a very beautiful project by Pavel Atielna, the same artist who did the um, uh, industrial zone project that I was talking about, has made another project that was a nominee, nominated also to one of the prizes, uh, where he has um, shot and filmed with drones like the old um, outlet, like industrial dump lakes in mm. Russia, and they have like these surreal colors. And how they so they look like strange galaxies from above, and they have some paintings of them. And he has um, like done another project where he has traced his garbage by putting GPS into it and uh, really showing uh, some stuff. So it's very interesting to just a tip to check mm -hmm. out. This is very interesting, and I, I'm just thinking that uh, because we are also sending this through on Facebook, that maybe. Afterwards, we can add some links to, to some of these uh, artists that you're, you're mentioning. And you mentioned also some, some uh, um, uh, photographs or images that you wanted to see. So we can share that with those. I sometimes also out. hope that introducing questions such as climate mm -hmm. could uh, be a ground for uh, more of a discussion and more of a debate uh, between artists that are otherwise very divided in their points of view or parts of society that are otherwise divided. Because I think when we face some real common challenges, maybe. But at the same time, I mean, if you go back to the Polish example, um, the Polish current establishment is uh, challenging some of the ideas of climate threats. 
Uh, so maybe they would, I mean, maybe the next exhibition in the uh, Center for Contemporary Art in Warsaw will be uh, artists showing an alternative vision of climate dangers. Who knows? Who knows? Could be possible. Evan, would you like to come in with the perspective from, from, from your Sure. I mean, I, I, I think that, um, sure. Yeah, the, uh, I think the best that uh, an artist can do with respect to, to climate change is, is create sustained awareness of a problem that hopefully leads to some sort of resources being brought to bear on something specific or in general that's that will somehow lead to a, some sort of a policy change i think you know artists are uh, like many other like basically everyone is are fairly powerless on their own to initiate major policy changes on the kind of level that's needed to combat an issue like climate change and you know i i don't really I don't really know where to go from here because like in America, like climate change was like something that happened in the polar regions and you could do a project that would um, sort of express like shock, like look at all of this ice melting. And then you could do a project maybe as things got a little closer to home that was that was fear. And, and now I don't know like what what sort of creative expression other than trying to shame people into doing the right thing would be effective anymore. Um, but it's not, um, of course, this is not like a, a, a polar problem anymore. This is not just a Baltic problem. I, we had, you know, for the second time in three weeks, a once in a 500 year <laughs> ferocity storm right here in New York City. Uh, just, you know, I mean, that, that hurricane Ida, that remnants of which parked itself over the Northeast just 10 days ago, we had the the uh, the most rainfall in New York that has ever happened in a one day period, and um, and this is like every couple of months this sort of thing is happening now. So it's it's a problem for everyone. I don't. I think maybe artists have carried the ball as as far as they can in some ways on that, and we we actually just we need our political leaders to like use their political capital on this problem that is no longer something that's hypothetical but that's i don't I, that might not be for this specific forum i mean we can we sh we can and we could st still like keep needling away and say this is important this is i mean that's what artists do after all right but um it's such a huge huge problem but it again circles back to what is the role of the artist in society and you all answered very clearly no 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 on the question that was posed earlier uh, uh, in terms of uh, where artists are heading with their, with their art um, now we are drawing to close uh, here so uh, I would like to ask you for maybe a final comment um, Ellen would you like to is there something you would like to add before we uh... Uh, <clears throat> yeah maybe because um, <clears throat> I think the examples that I was talking about, uh, artists handling like the memory of the Soviet Union in their art, everything was very subtle, but I would like just to pose the question like whether this is because they are seeing how, for example, historians handling the more severe parts are being treated and they are trying to be more subtle in their message. And if there is uh, some kind of criticism in their art or not. I think uh, last week I participated in some talks here in Sweden with a uh, with, uh, Russian writer, Sergei Lebedev, and he says that the Soviet Union found its, uh, I mean, was focused on the future and legitimized it, its rule by a future utopia that, uh, excused everything they did uh, now because it was towards creating this better society. Uh, contemporary Russia finds its legitimacy in the past and that's why it's, it has all these, uh, uh, let's say, historical uh, controversies and contro historical policy towards how to understand the past and the role of the Soviet Union in World War II and so on. And I think that Russia here serves as an example of what, where we are 
all of us, because I think the Swedish society, the Polish society, many of societies, the American society, were uh, driven by a sort of forward looking idea. And I think we're all in some kind of reverse <laughs> mode right now, where we're all looking back towards periods that we idealize, that we think were great, that we uh, want to uh, look back upon. And I think what we really need to do as artists and people working with culture and art is maintain this idea that we're discussing a future. We're, we're, we're keeping the idea of a future alive. And I think this is very important. I think if we start focusing on a joint future, we'll find more constructive debates. That's what I think. And I would just kind of continue that with saying that I think that a lot of what these social programs at my and other institutions really is, is a sort of concrete manifestation of a hopefulness um, that there that there is a, a, a better place towards which we're kind of slowly and abstractly closing in on. And um, that by remembering that we have uh, special abilities as artists and as creative people um, to influence that conversation, uh, that, that there's the possibility of, of getting a little bit closer to that. Thank you. And uh, in one of the comments that uh, came up uh, here uh, relating to climate change, is the fact that uh, we're seeing a trend perhaps towards residencies rather than uh, quick touring, for instance. And I'm just thinking that sitting together and working deeply <laughs> with a craft and the future uh, of where that craft is, is heading might be sort of the conclusion of, of this discussion. Uh, and and also... the pandemic has taught us to discuss this way yeah. as well, which yes. is also good. For... Which is very good. Yeah. <laughs> My carbon footprint has gone way down the last year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's been such a pleasure to have you uh, with us from New York and here in Stockholm at the Swedish Institute. Ellen Sakazian, Åkerman, Stefan Ingersson, and Evan Fine. Uh, so thank you very much.